Hi, everyone. Um, so last year, I a little, little loud. Um, last year, I worked on a technology project in humanitarian aid for the first time. And uh, today, I want to share some notes that I wrote mainly as reminders to myself and my colleagues about the environment that we work in, but which will hopefully also be uh, helpful to you and make you think differently about the way that you approach the problems that you face. So let's start at the beginning. Um, everything is way more difficult in this context than you are used to, and nothing works the way that you expect it to. Um, the most basic infrastructure may be unreliable or even entirely unavailable, and accurate numbers are somewhat hard to come by, but uh, to give you some idea, Sub-Saharan Africa has a population of maybe 900 million people. Um, only a third of them have regular access to electricity and maybe about two-thirds have access to clean drinking water. Plus, um, a quarter of the population is more than half an hour walking away from the nearest water source. Um, the situation is improving rapidly, fortunately, um, but the current situation is still pretty dire. Um, large parts of your target group for humanitarian aid projects may also live in so-called hard-to-reach areas. And that term, hard to reach, is somewhat of an understatement, as reaching them might involve a combination of helicopters, 4 by 4s dirt bikes, and rickety ferries to take you across the river because the nearest bridge is hours and hours away. Uh, the tropical rain season and trade winds that blow up massive dust storms also don't make going into the field any easier. So this all... These, these very basic things already have a large impact on how you run technology projects. And besides needing a solid logistics operation to take care of this, uh, for projects that use mobile devices, for instance, you will have to provide some kind of power supply. And that's usually either in the form of batteries and solar panels or charging stations like the one pictured. Um, for fixed devices, the situation is really not that much better. Um, there are very few ISPs, there are essentially no data centers. Um, so inevitably, you will see 19-inch uh, racks stuffed into broom closets, a bunch of equipment laid out on tables, um, and you will somehow have to cope. Getting equipment into these places is also incredibly tricky, and you would think that during a massive disease outbreak, getting th medical supplies and, and technical equipment through customs would be easy, but apparently, if you think that, you haven't encountered West African bureaucracy before. So uh, in practice, a lot of people fly in with uh, suitcases full of equipment every time you go in and out of the country. Security is also um, a major issue, and unfortunately, the need for humanitarian aid projects is generally the, the highest where the security situation is the most volatile. Uh, personally, I've never had to think about my, uh, my personal security, but some of my direct colleagues have, and it just makes everything that little extra bit harder. And you also have to always keep health issues in mind. Uh, you do not want to seek medical treatment uh, in a lot of these places. Uh, so be fully vaccinated, even for the most obscure diseases that you can imagine. Um, bring bags full of just basic medication with you, your, your ibuprofen, your, your paracetamol. You're going to need all of that because you can't find it locally. Um, when it comes to computer security, this is also an interesting environment. Um, most of the devices that you will encounter are going to be nearing the end of life if they're not already posted. Um, they're going to be running outdated software, and maintaining security at that level is a lost cause. You can still um, maintain information security to some extent um, when you run web applications. Uh, let's say most of them are. Um, but. Uh, just general information security is really tricky. And, the, and this is a, a large problem because of the types of data that you deal with. Personally, identifiable information um, is strictly regulated here and over there as well. Um, generally, the ministries of health will uh, require you to store all data within the country. And um, you will need to find backup solutions. You will need to find um, ways to comply with these laws. And then suddenly, in the case of an emergency outbreak or a disease outbreak, 
uh, all these requirements are thrown out the window and you can host in the cloud. This is actually preferable. Um, once you've experienced uh, the primary server for one of your projects, uh, experience like irrecoverable uh, hardware failure due to torrential rains pouring through the roof, you're, go <laughs> you're going to think a little bit differently about um, uh, how reliable the, the providers that we're used to here actually are. <laughs> Um, again, uh, maintaining uh, information security is hard because you're going to be working with all kinds of different organizations and once you hand out credentials, you don't know whose hands they might end up in, but rolling those credentials might um, disrupt people's work, uh, so there's some weird trade-offs there and, and I don't know how I feel about how easily access to um, personal data is, is given out, but it's basically a necessity. All right, next up. Connectivity is absolutely vital for all of these projects. And one of the first things that logisticians and technicians do when they fly into some, um, some crisis area where uh, perhaps there was uh, an, an earthquake, uh, the first thing they will do is set up basic ham radio so people in different areas can at least coordinate uh, where the aid should go. Uh, cell phone networks might not be available to begin with and uh, of course after a natural disaster they will invariably fail and you will have to come up with some kind of backup plan for that. That said, it's not all bad though. Um, staying in touch with uh, people you care about is, is a basic human need everywhere and uh, in developing countries a lot of disposable income goes towards just cell phone credit. Um, Usage is massively on the rise everywhere. Networks are being rolled out uh, across the world. Um, and the coverage is better than you might expect. I, I remember one instance where I had 3G and I was just going through my email right on the edge of a tropical rainforest. Uh, in the last decade or so, um, cell phone ownership has gone from maybe less than 10% in, in sub-Saharan Africa and, and uh, developing countries in, in a similar position to well above half in Africa now. Um, the developments in, in Myanmar uh, make for an interesting case. Uh, only five years ago or so, a SIM card would cost uh, thousands of dollars and only be available to the very elites and they would get really terrible service and there was one operator. Um, by now the market has opened up a little bit um, and so in the last five years cell phone ownership has gone to about 80% and 95% of the population has coverage there. They're even getting 3G or 4G now. Um, and this is a trend across the world where um, these kinds of connectivity weren't available before. Um, they're being introduced so rapidly and everybody, everybody, even the, the poorest people will have at least a cell phone or their family members will. So a problem with the way uh, these networks are being rolled out is that um, Landlines were skipped entirely. It's really hard to dig fiber optic cables through a rainforest or that kind of thing. So generally uh, backhaul and even in urban areas is all done using uh, wireless technology of some kind, using microwave devices like the I cropped it out. That's unfortunate. There's, um, uh, there's devices on uh, these towers that you might not see as often here, um, which look like big drums. Um, and you can get maybe uh, 100 megabits or so over those. Um, a bunch of these devices will be put up on the towers even by the same operators because they need multiple of them uh, to go into different points in the country. And when you're working on a technology product, uh, project and you have to provide connectivity to a new site, the default option is to go build some towers and establish some of these microwave links. Um, if that's not feasible, then essentially your only fallback option is uh, satellite connections. Mm. Having both at the same time can be useful. Uh, redundancy is always good, of course. Um, but the problem is that uh, all of these technologies uh, require a clear line of sight. Um, so uh, in, the, in the case of bad weather, both your point-to-point -point link and your satellite link will go down and that gives an interesting meaning to the term cloud problems. Um, <laughs> 
if you, uh, if you know where your devices are in the country physically, you have some idea, uh, then you can essentially see where thunderstorms are just by looking at your packet loss graphs. Um, the latencies are also incredible. Um, there's one main uh, cable running down the West African coast and the latency from Europe to get there is maybe about 50 milliseconds or so. Um, latencies inland from where the landing point is to maybe a couple hundred miles into the country are going to be on the order of seconds. Um, because there is also no redundancy um, in these lines, uh, you might encounter country-wide internet outages. That is still a thing in some places. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> now, the way to uh, cope with all these issues, essentially the only way to deliver um, in this context is by having a very thorough understanding of the processes that you're trying to support. You cannot build entirely reliable systems, so you have to choose which areas uh, you do make reliable or how you deal with failures, how your software copes with uh, intermittently failing connections and not just being offline or online. Um, and in many cases, actually establishing some kind of simple physical process is preferable to uh, trying to use technology for something. And a common example of this is uh, uh, d dipping fingers in ink after you voted to prevent double voting. That's really simple, it's straightforward. You can roll it out, you just give every voting booth a jar of ink. You don't need any technology for that. Um, this idea can also be extended. Um, so for example, um, in the uh, Nigerian polio eradication campaign, all the houses uh, are marked with the number of inhabitants, uh, and their vaccination status, um, so that every time uh, people go out into the field, they can directly see where they need to go and they don't have to use some kind of device. Uh, there are no maps, um, so, uh, making some kind of uh, application um, where you can you know, tap on a house and see what the current status is. This is entirely not viable. Um, generally, uh, the, uh, there's some kind of combination between a, a straightforward physical process and then aggregation at a higher level uh, where data analysis has to happen. Um, and that's all done electronically. Now, paper is still a viable option for a lot of things, and you should never discount that. Uh, most workflows in the software projects I supported in an operations role can be traced back directly to some kind of paper process that was already in place. And uh, again, understanding exactly why those forms have certain fields on them, why they're handed to certain people at which point in time uh, will inform how you design uh, your software and also um, Sticking to that existing process means that paper can still be used as a fallback option in case that your technology uh, solution does go down for whatever reason. Um, the National Emergency Call Center in, in Sierra Leone, for instance, um, has stacks of paper um, next to each operator's desk so that in case the software goes down, they can just grab a form and start writing immediately and then enter that back into the system later for, for processing. Um, technology going down should never uh, cause the, the process, uh, in, especially in an emergency context, to, to grind to a halt. And really just even um, a blank piece of paper and a pen uh, will get you through a lot of this. Um, again, understanding the way that people work and um, why a certain process was implemented uh, allows you to make interesting decisions in the, in the way your software works. Um, a good example of this would be for uh, uh, emergency dispatching, um, that uh, every district where central dispatchers are located um, has a copy of the call center software running. Um, they get all the data coming in from the central point where the operators first pick up the phone when somebody calls. And then um, as soon as uh, that information ends up at the, at the dispatching site, they can continue to do their work and they might have a long backlog, so they won't even need more data to be coming in at the time 
uh, to continue to do their work. But your software needs to understand um, when certain links can break. Uh, paper, again, and combinations of paper and technology are uh, very common for surveying or, or keeping uh, track of, of stocks. Um, what happens generally is people go out into the field with a stack of paper, they go visit a bunch of different sites, uh, they write everything down, and then once they get back to an area with good connectivity, they enter it into some kind of central system. Right, so well, communication um, between different areas is vitally important. Sometimes you really need to bring everybody into the same room. Uh, even just providing spaces that have stable electricity, connectivity, and other necessities where people from different organizations or different parts of organizations can come together will uh, improve their decision making, improve response times, and that's going to be far more valuable than actually introducing some kind of software there. The next one is like a little bit tough when it comes to these nodes. You should be really careful about introducing technology um, in these contexts as it can be actively harmful. Uh, everybody in the field obviously has the very best intentions, but that might not be enough. And in around 2012, the Ugandan Ministry of Health declared a total moratorium on all new mobile technology healthcare related projects. There were dozens of pilots, all with overlapping areas uh, of work and completely incompatible technology, adding a massive strain to an already overburdened healthcare system and just allowing people to keep doing their work and building up the healthcare system um, would, would have been way better than trying to solve these, uh, the problems they were facing with some kind of new mobile device that people were entirely unfamiliar with. And automating tasks away can also um, uh, it, it cause lines of communication to break. So um, where previously um, to coordinate stock levels in a certain area, healthcare workers would have to call each other regularly. Um, by automating that away, you break the lines of communication and suddenly they're not having discussions about other things that are going on as well anymore. So directly involving all of your stakeholders and including the end users, going out into the field is the only way to make sure that you're actually helping. There are some organizations that uh, provide technically solid software, but they don't send people into the field and often there's a huge mismatch between um, what they end up implementing and what's needed or if it's even viable to implement this beautiful app. Now, within the, uh, your own technology department, fortunately things are going to be a lot easier. And standard distributed teams practices apply, uh, communicate asynchronously, that's gonna be necessary because the latencies in your networks aren't just higher, the latencies in communication are gonna be higher as well when your project managers go out into the field and have no connectivity for several days. Um, and to write software, you're generally going to need uh, a decent internet connection anyway, so you can keep using all the tools that you're used to. For support, however, you're going to have to cope with large amounts of email coming in. You're going to have to hand out phone numbers, uh, do calls, do text messaging, um, because those are the only viable options in areas where your end users actually are and they don't have a stable enough inter internet connection to join your group chat or whatever. So um, when you're, <laughs> when you're uh, working on systems that uh, can easily achieve, let's say, more than two nines of availability. Um, you can aggressively monitor all your components and make structural improvements to their reliability. Um, but this is generally just not feasible. It's not an option. So um, it's uh, sometimes really important to just hand out your escalation email to everybody in the field. And this is going to overwhelm you. And I, I guess a lot of us here have experienced alert fatigue at some point. Well get used to it, that is uh, part of the job in, in this context. Um, the, the main reason is that um, if there's three layers uh, between your end users and your operations team, when an issue is reported, uh, important details might go missing. Uh, these issues might not even reach you at all because by the time that it goes through the chain, the issue is resolved and so you don't get escalated anymore. 
Um, and because monitoring is really hard in this context, you actually need direct feedback from your users to inform you on um, uh, what, what types of failures they're experiencing, how they're working around that, which parts of your software you can potentially um, Im improve to make all of that easier for them. So, all right, I have here some lessons um, that uh, do apply elsewhere as well that I learned in the field. Um, let's start with, I will never ever consider any type of network reliable again. <laughs> So whether you're dealing with microwave links between remote sites in the desert or uh, a dark fiber link between your data center, at some point it's going to fill and you have to consider all of the different failure modes. Uh, for an end user, there might be no distinguishable difference between having 99% packet loss and a complete link down, but your software might not think about it that way. And especially if you have incredibly high latencies, all kinds of weird synchronization issues can crop up. This applies um, to our, the, the modern distributed microservices architectures that we're building as well. Any point um, might break, um, and it might break in subtly unexpected ways. Having some kind of local knowledge is, uh, is really important. Um, if you're building a consumer app, that might be different, or you might be the end user yourself, but if you're working in a field um, where you're, not, you're never going to be the direct user of the software you're supporting, you still need to understand uh, the context people work in, um, wh what their job involves, just go out into the field, go work with them. I've worked in healthcare for a long time, um, and I've worked with uh, local healthcare employees in, uh, in Europe as well. Uh, there's also a lot of talent uh, in developing countries, and if you can foster that and bring software developers, or network engineers into your team, uh, you're going to make much better decisions as a result because they grew up in this context and they know all the constraints and they will be able to say, well, that's a very nice idea, but have you been here? No. <laughs> um, and similarly, you should also try to um, send people from uh, your entire software development organization into the field. So it shouldn't just be the project managers who go out there to gather requirements. It shouldn't just be uh, infrastructure engineers like myself who actually need to do work on the ground, but sending software engineers over there for a couple weeks will give them an entirely different perspective as well. Um, and doing that continuously will dramatically improve the, the quality of the solutions that you come up with from a very early point when you're conceptualizing uh, also uh, all the way to the end where you're facing certain problems and you need to think about what would actually work. Um, now, if you run um, across a, a large set of data centers, um, you should always be monitoring all your connections as close to the edge as possible. If uh, links break, um, and your monitoring can't report back, uh, then you have, um, then you might be missing out on what's going on uh, within the country. So if the, uh, if you do experience, let's say, a countrywide internet outage and you alert on not getting any data from your nodes within the country, uh, you might think that everything is broken while your microwave links within the country are still working perfectly and nobody there is experiencing any, any issues. Um, Ultimately, no matter what context you work in, this is an important one for me as well. You own your availability. Probably most people here have never had to think about uh, power supplies or having enough fuel to power your generators at the Ministry of Health Building or that kind of thing. Um, and while that might not be a consideration for you, you still have to think about what happens when your data center has a power outage that might be a rare occurrence. Could happen though, could lose a bunch of money with that. So, it is still your responsibility to think about every layer um, up to the point where your software is actually running. This went way quicker than I expected. <laughs> um, finally, I'd like to say that, um, yeah, I've been working in healthcare for a long time um, and I haven't been able to let any of the subject matter go uh, since I started, I've, I've worked at various companies for a while and then just somehow gotten back into the healthcare field every time. It is the most worthwhile work that I've ever done and I would highly recommend you to at least consider 
working in the healthcare field, the, the need for it is really high. Even the most uh, developed healthcare systems, like the ones here, still uh, place a massive burden on healthcare employees, and smart tooling, smart technology can drastically improve the healthcare outcomes for a lot of people. I can't think of anything better to spend my time on. Thanks for listening. Um, also, plenty of time left. I imagine there might be some questions. <laughs> Yeah? Um, like any weird nuance around the microwave technology of like sound or heat or like just huh? like sound or heat that you have to deal with like as a consequence of having your connectivity for microwave? Oh, uh, no, I don't think I'd recommend standing directly in the line of sight between these towers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, flying through and just getting zapped, no. It's, it's really not that powerful. I mean, just with any other kind of radiation, yeah, you shouldn't expose yourself to too much of it, but that's not really a concern. No, no bad scientist experiments, like ham and cheese sandwiches? No, not, not, not so much. I mean, I climbed up in a tower once, and that was a bit of a weird experience, but no, I didn't try to get a grilled cheese out of it. <laughs> Good one, let me repeat that. So uh, what is the technology stack for these kinds of applications? Uh, a lot of end users already have uh, cell phones and do you use that? Can you use modern uh, front end development techniques? Actually, yes you can. Um, delivering value uh, for healthcare workers using just feature phones um, is hard. There are some systems in place where uh, information can be exchanged over SMS. There's a lot of work being done in uh, automating um, simple messaging workflows. Um, but for almost all the projects I worked on, we would uh, ship devices into the field ourselves. They would generally be somewhat outdated Android phones. Um, and um, uh, you can develop any type of application as you normally would for those. Uh, so you're, you're talking about a closed system where it's like for health and care, you're getting like these Android, Android phones with your software into their hands. But yeah. Right. Um, there are definitely a lot of organizations doing good work um, uh, on mobile messaging specifically, um, which is available to yeah, more than half the population and more than that can also get direct access to a phone from a family member, from a neighbor, that kind of thing. Um, there are organizations um, uh, that build uh, very simple systems like um, uh, reminders for uh, appointments at clinics. Um, once you go into a clinic for a treatment the first time, uh, some basic data is taken down, like a phone number. Um, then the day before your appointment and the day itself, uh, you get a reminder, and this drastically increases the uh, rates of anti-retroviral medicine take up uh, where these projects are being rolled out. There's also um, a friend of mine who uh, works in that field. And uh, they do all kinds of experiments, like uh, uh, delivering Wikipedia over SMS. Um, when you're faced with, a, uh, uh, with the choice of going to your local bush doctor or getting information from a reliable source, those kinds of things also improve the, the way people think about their access to healthcare and that kind of thing. And, and there are, yeah, a lot of projects um, that make use of the fact that a lot of people have at least the very most basic connectivity available right in their pockets. So answer you. Anybody else? All right, I suppose not.